Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer, and today we will be discussing the work and progress made in the fight against HIV AIDS with special guests, Kelsey Louie, Gay Men's Health Crisis CEO, that's GMHC in New York, Jesse Milan, President and CEO of AIDS United in Washington, D.C., and John Peller, President and CEO of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. So thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. And um, just sort of to set you up, I'm going to go over to you, uh, Kelsey. Uh, the world has 38 million people living with HIV AIDS and of these 1.2 million are in the United States. And since the world became aware of AIDS in the 80s, a lot has changed. And despite life-sustaining treatments, there is still no cure. So let's talk about the situation that faces the AIDS community and the world at large. I mean, we've seen a lot of recent advance in medical technology, but for AIDS, there is still no cure. Kelsey, could you give us the picture from GMHC's perspective and how you are shaping your programs for today's world and for the future fight against AIDS? Sure, thanks, Mark. First, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, especially with Jesse and, and John. So thank you for having me. Um, so as you know, um, GMHC is the world's first aid service organization, and you're right, a lot has changed over the past 40 years. And something that GMHC has done is to follow the data and to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our community. In the early 80s, that meant making sure that people were educated about how HIV was transmitted, and in particular, how it wasn't transmitted. Um, and throughout the last four decades, we've been trying to create services to help people living with HIV and AIDS and for those people who are at risk. So today, that means really um, strategizing about how to curate our prevention messages to those who, where the data says are most impacted by HIV and AIDS. It also means creating particular programs for those that are hardest hit. In this case, it's older adults living with HIV um, in New York City. Um, today, about 50% of people living with HIV are over 50. And so making sure that we uh, provide services to long-term survivors and older adults with HIV and AIDS. Also, young black, um, gay, uh, black and Latino gay men are still disproportionately impacted, as well as transgender women, especially transgender women of color. Um, and so the other thing that we're doing is making sure that we address what we call the social drivers of HIV and AIDS. So that means things like untreated mental health issues, untreated substance use issues, unstable housing, and food insecurity. So making sure that we provide support to those areas as well. Jesse, do you think that, that the ignorance that pervaded AIDS in the 80s, that there's still a flavor of that uh, here today, or do you feel that people have much more uh, access to, to information? To what extent, what, you know, I think Kelsey accurately ca characterized the early days, it was really first about informing people. Um, when, when you get to the point where people are already informed, then you can get to a next, a next step. To what extent are you focused on just countering ignorance today? Well, that's still a big part of our work. Um, that's still a big part of our work. You know, um, Partly that's generational. I think with the advances, um, one of the side effects of the advances in medication is that um, younger generations don't know the period of time where the gay community was decimated. And so there is some apathy and complacency around it. And there are still some people who have misguided conceptions around HIV and AIDS, that it's no longer a problem. It is still very much a public health crisis. And Jesse, um, from your perspective in Washington, how do you see it? Well, thank you so much, Mark. I'm thrilled to be here, especially with John and Kelsey. Um, Age United is a national organization uh, focused on public policy with Congress and the administration and our strategic grant making. Over the years, we've given away about $120 million and we support grassroots organizations. And I'm so pleased to have both John and Kelsey on this webinar with us because they are members of our Public Policy Council, GMHC and AIDS Foundation of Chicago. So we work together to help create a different environment for people living with and vulnerable to HIV. And I think part of the problem is that 
Uh, we haven't seen in the media the kind of deaths that we saw in the 90s and the 80s, but deaths still occur worldwide, almost a million every year, including, including nearly 15,000 in the United States each year. Plus, we still have new infections every year. New transmissions are occurring, especially among gay men and the LBGTQ community in the United States. But on top of those, we have a crisis of sexually transmitted diseases in this country, nearly 20 million a year. And every single instance of one of those transmissions, be it chlamydia, gonorrhea, hepatitis, herpes, you name it, every single one of those is an instance where HIV could have been transmitted. And I think that's part of the problem that half of those transmissions, those 20 million are occurring among people under the age of 24. And so if our sexual health education for our young people is not happening, then we have a very, very big problem. In fact, the CDC tells us that at least 1.2 million people in the United States are highly vulnerable to HIV. So we've got a crisis that's ready to continue to explode and explode and explode year after year after year in this country. Mark, if, 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 I could, if I could jump in, um, and Mark, thanks for having me, and uh, Kelsey and Jesse, great to, to see you both. Um, I think uh, Kelsey and Jesse have done a really great job of presenting some of, of the challenges that we're facing in the HIV sector, um, but I'm going to um, spread a little sunshine here, um, which is not my usual, usual role, but um, the, the great news uh, about HIV today is that we now have PrEP, which is uh, medication um, available for the first time in a generic form um, that is almost 100% effective when taken consistently and correctly. Um, we also know that when so people- could you describe, could, John, could you describe what PrEP is? Sure, so PrEP is a uh, medication. The brand name is uh, Truvada. There's also another drug called Descovi and there's a generic available. Um, and it's an HIV, started as an HIV treatment medication, uh, but for um, over a decade, it's been approved by the FDA to prevent uh, uh, transmission of HIV. And it can be taken either daily um, or um, kind of as needed um, to prevent uh, HIV. And it's almost 100% effective when taken consistently and correctly. So really important intervention to, to that's just transformed the landscape of our work. Uh, we also now know that when people living with HIV are effectively treated and their viral load is suppressed, they cannot transmit HIV sexually. And the slogan for this is U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. Uh, and so that um, has really fueled efforts uh, in our individual jurisdictions and across the country to have conversations about ending the HIV epidemic. And this is certainly something we never could have dreamed of um, 40 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, now, of course, there's tremendous challenges uh, to doing that, um, which we will talk about, I'm sure. But the fact that we're having these conversations now about what it might take to actually end the HIV epidemic, um, not with a cure and not with a vaccine, but with the medications and the knowledge we have about social determinants of health and addressing those um, to, uh, to make progress in the epidemic. One of the things that I, that I was wondering about your take on is that during the 80s, there was a, a big part of the culture war that surrounded um, AIDS. And that culture war resulted in a lot of misinformation, uh, a lot of uh, purposeful disinformation, and then a, then a lot of uh, finger pointing and condemnation and, and shame and all sorts of different um, non-productive uh, activities um, that stifled progress. How do you see today's uh, environment? Are we still part of this culture war here? Or have we kind of gotten over it in which we can actually treat people for the conditions that they have and for the behaviors that they exhibit, um, as opposed to, um, to engaging in these, these silly dialogues that are not based in science and not based in behaviors? Jesse, you want to give a, 
uh, first cut at this? Well, I think part of the culture war of today is around racial justice. And I think that the story that is not known by the wider public is that the HIV epidemic significantly impacts people of color, particularly African-American communities, and especially communities in the South. Nearly half of all the people living with HIV in this country are African-American, but we only make up approximately 12 or 13% of the population. Because our, our visual images of HIV are still very much stuck in the 80s and 90s where gay white men were mostly being impacted. You know, the, the, the picture of Rock Hudson is, is stuck in a lot of people's minds. That's not the case today. I mean, I'm a person living with HIV and I've been living with HIV for 38 years. Um, I represent the kind of people who are most vulnerable and who are not getting the access to medications and treatment that make it possible to obtain an undetectable viral load and to live a long and healthy life. And frankly, of those Americans who are still dying of AIDS, it's mostly African-Americans. So that culture war is now much more around not, not same-sex marriage, which is a great outcome of the HIV epidemic because it showed gay men and showed the world that our lives and our loves are equal to others. But today we need to also focus on the racial justice issue of inequities with regard to healthcare access. So it's less a culture war issue uh, than, a, than an issue in your view of of inequities, of, of racism, systemic racism, how these, these uh, elements um, are embedded in our society and need to be addressed uh, in an overarching way. Is that what you're saying, Jesse? Absolutely. We need, to, we need to dig into all of our systems, including our healthcare system, to analyze what needs to change to actually create equity. You know, equity is different from equality. Working on equity can help us get to equality, but in order to get to equity, we have to move up those who are unequal and provide the resources and the systems to move people to a more equitable future. How do you see it, Kelsey? If I can piggyback off of what John and Jesse have said, you know, um, we have made a lot of advances and we have a lot of the tools to help end the HIV epidemic. However, uh, combining the two, what the last two comments, we really need to address it in the black and brown communities. Um, the CDC put out a report a few years ago that said one in four um, Latino men will um, have an HIV diagnosis in their lifetimes and one in two black men. And that is, those statistics are staggering. And um, that has to be addressed. And it has to be addressed through systemic racism of, of systems like healthcare, um, criminal justice, and that's part of the solution, I think, um, as Jesse mentioned. Um, we have to look at what are the things preventing these certain communities from reaching the solutions that John mentioned. And I think that is part of the answer as to how we really make progress. How do we invest in, in solving these issues? Because Inequity. I mean, if we have, as John pointed out, is we have the ability to uh, to use medical technology to suppress vectors of transmission in the AIDS case or to treat AIDS. It all comes down to money, being able to afford to to fund this. How do we deal with this as a society? You know, there's always this this debate about uh, uh, tax revenue and and government spending and. Um, and uh, income redistribution, all these different aspects. Uh, John, how do, you, how do you see solving a medical crisis and the return on investment in solving a medical crisis so that people who do not have, their needs are addressed so that that medical crisis dissipates? How do we deal with that? That's, uh, I think, the, the question we're all uh, struggling with right now. Um, with you know, COVID, I, I think, right? I mean, that's, absolutely, absolutely, right, right, with COVID. My and neighbor, I, neighbor has COVID, it's, it's, it, it's not good for me, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I think um, this is where the uh, intersectionality of our approaches becomes so critical. And if we just try and focus solely on HIV and stay in our, our lane or our silo, we're not gonna make progress, but if we're also 
um, partnering with other organizations and other sectors in the conversation, we are going to make progress. So if we're also um, uh, engaged in conversations around ending systemic racism, you know, here we are on the anniversary of George Floyd's murder, um, about a uh, living wage um, for workers, about housing affordability, not just for people living with HIV or vulnerable to HIV, but for everyone. That's how we're gonna address, um, address uh, HIV and STIs. Um, I think we saw um, with the rescue plan, uh, Congress and the Biden administration invest in um, support for families in a tremendous way with the uh, with, uh, $600 or 300, whatever it is, child tax credit. And that's, I think, an example of the kind of universal approach that we need to take, um, for example, around expanding access to uh, Medicaid and, and comprehensive health insurance across the nation, not just in states that have decided to adopt Medicaid expansion. How do we make, Mark, uh, go, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, several years ago, there was a saying in the AIDS community that we have the data and we have the tools to end the epidemic. What we need is the political will. And that political will means dollars. And so I think we're, we might be coming up to a point of a reckoning around Black Lives Matter, Black HIV Lives Matter, Black Trans Lives Matter. And we, I think the AIDS community, we need to push our elected officials to demonstrate those ideals and invest in the resources that, require, that are required in order to move forward um, in ending the epidemic. And I think we have lessons from the COVID epidemic uh, COVID pandemic and the, particularly the American response that can now be applied to the HIV epidemic in the United States because the uh, Biden administration made it possible for everyone to have access to the vaccination. But we don't have, as Kelsey and John have said, access to health insurance for everyone who needs it. And the 13 or so states that have not expanded Medicaid coverage are the very states, particularly in the South, where we have a raging HIV problem because people simply do not have access to health care. And remember, HIV, unlike COVID, is a chronic disease that requires your constant management to make sure that you are getting to undetectable. So the virus isn't replicating and create and destroying your immune system and, and creating the possibility of, of living, of, of obtaining AIDS or being diagnosed with AIDS and then dying. That requires a lifelong effort <laughs> and lifelong access to medications and healthcare. So basically what you're all arguing is that when it comes to health in particular, because of the interconnectedness of people, right? That uh, health is, in investing in health of a neighbor is actually a worthy investment in terms of just social good. It's not necessarily um, redistribution of means that I have that do not benefit me. It's basically investing of uh, our means, society's means, into uh, creating a circumstance where there can be pursuit of, uh, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? So, so um, let's go beyond this in terms of, of how do we end AIDS? Because uh, John, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the um, idea of, of reducing vectors of transmission through behavioral uh, changes, but also through drugs and, and treatments and so on and so forth, information dissemination. Is there also a sufficient progress being made and sufficient investment uh, into uh, finding an actual cure to, to uh, knock out the virus? Jesse, what, what does your information tell you? You know, our friend and all of us know Tony Fauci very well because he is an HIV doctor at his heart and researcher. He will, st he will tell you that we still don't have a vaccine for HIV, but we do have tools to make it possible to live a healthy life with HIV. But a vaccine is certainly something that we still aspire to. And until then, we have to make sure that the tools for PrEP so that you don't acquire the virus and, the, and that everyone who is living with HIV has access to medications so that they can get to undetectable 
we have to make sure that those two that those two tools are available to all who need them. We also learned lessons from the misinformation that went out on COVID in terms of AIDS, because there's still misinformation out there on AIDS, the cause of AIDS, and the treatment for AIDS, particularly when you go into the international arena, uh, you see the uh, misinformation gaining a foothold. Uh, Kelsey, do you do you feel like there, there's been uh, lessons learned that the community can use to uh, ensure that people are well informed and are quick yeah. to take appropriate actions? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so I mean, there's the obvious case of the role that fear plays in how in what information is disseminated. But something that I've learned uh, very acutely and um, with COVID is the changing nature of the information. And over time, mm -hmm. in, a, in this case, a short amount of time, information had changed. And what does that mean for certain people? Some people felt that that meant no one knew what was going on. But we had to say that information was being updated. Similarly with HIV, but in a longer time frame, information was getting updated as to what was safe, what wasn't safe. And so we really need, and it, it's really important that um, people are disseminating proper information and that people are getting their information from the right sources. Um, and, and to that, related to that is whenever some, so we all know that Billy Porter just revealed his HIV status and the importance of that information and that um, stigma busting information that a celebrity that is like Billy Porter, um, you know, and, and then if we stop and think about it, the fact that it took him so long to reveal his status is a shame around, or an indicator of how much shame there still is around HIV and AIDS. Well, you know, it's, we, we just finished two polls. The first poll, it's interesting. We, we asked initially uh, viewed as, as primarily affecting gay men and intravenous drug users. Today, people view HIV AIDS and we gave a number of different options. 38% um, said, that um, AIDS is, view is viewed as having been solved or not as a major concern, 38%. Um, we also had 25% each as a condition that impacts and should concern everyone and basically uh, viewed in the same way that it always has. So it's, it's really interesting to see how uh, people view AIDS. I know that, that um, uh, my kids who are in their, in their 20s um, do not view AIDS as the major concern that it, that it was in the past. Uh, John, do you feel that that's a justified view or do you think that it's a little naive? So I, it's completely understandable why uh, younger people in particular wouldn't, uh, wouldn't see HIV as, as um, the, the same way that you know, we might have 20, 30 years ago. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think, um, it, it makes total sense. Um, one of the challenges that we have uh, in um, the HIV sector is that people who are most vulnerable to HIV don't see it as a challenge for them. So, you know, like you're, I'm presuming white kids, HIV may not be a, a big threat for them, particularly if they're cisgender and heterosexual. But if we um, talk about young black gay men who are as Kelsey said, very, very vulnerable to HIV. They, for example, may not see PrEP as being for them. Um, and so it's so critical to change that narrative around why PrEP might be a fit for them and why it might be important for them to protect themselves and value themselves enough to take PrEP, um, which is about having messengers, so the Billy Porters of the world, uh, talking about PrEP. Um, and helping younger folks to really value their future and to ensure that they're taking steps to protect their, their health, um, which is not a simple one-off conversation. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Um, uh, your assumption isn't, isn't quite correct. Uh, my kids are biracial and they identify in different ways, um, but it also points to the issue of not just race, but this this whole idea of caste, right? Of of, of what uh, what you have access to. Uh, Jesse, as you're as you're looking at the evolving nature of AIDS, you know you've lived for, uh, with AIDS for 38 years. Um, there are a lot of people who have lived with AIDS for a really long time, and now uh, we have this uh, this issue of how do we maintain health as we get, all get older, right? We're, we're all dealing with it. 
Um, how do you see the, uh, the, the changes in the kinds of support that the AIDS community provides um, its constituents um, as we all get older and as, as society continues to move on? Well, it's a great question because already in 2021, more than half of the people in the United States living with HIV are age 50 or older. And so we are an aging population. Is Medicare prepared for us? Or is assisted living prepared for us? Are senior centers prepared for us? These are systemic questions that we, that we really have to look at as the, as the HIV population continues to age. And uh, on an individual level, as we age, we have other comorbidities of aging on top of HIV. And so making sure that people have access to care to handle all the other things that come with aging on top of HIV HIV is important. You know, CDC has just declared racism as a public health crisis. We need to really understand that even if one more person becomes HIV positive and that person becomes unemployed, becomes sick, that's a cost to the public. And the cost can be enormous just in terms of medications, but by averting that cost, we are saving literally millions and billions of dollars because we have in this country at least 400,000 people who are not yet getting the treatment they need to live a long and healthy life. Well, you're also can talking I, about the intersection of insurance, right, Kelsey? Yeah, actually, can I also add to the older population? Um, you know, um, we don't know what it's like to live with HIV for more than 40 years. We don't know what it's like to be, to be taking antiretrovirals for more than 20 so years. These are all things that we're learning and that's why research is so critical. And um, GMHC several years ago launched a website called aginghiv.org that starts to disseminate some of this information. So kind of harkening back to our early days of educating uh, the community about um, what, you know, what are the emerging issues of older people living with HIV and long-term survivors, but also this website also provides national resources. So um, aginghiv.org. Aginghiv.org. So we're coming to the end of our time, John. Um, we're going to give you a word, and then Jesse, we're going to give you the last word. In terms of the, the, the future going forward, uh, we've talked about uh, information and misinformation. We've talked about um, care to, um, to um, uh, people who are aging. Are we talking here ultimately about a transformation of a sector in which HIV considerations is integrated into everything? It's sort of like heart disease or, or cancer or diabetes, where while it is a separate, there are separate conditions, um, as we get older, it's just part of, of what we're going to encounter. And it really is something that we need to think about in a different way in terms of how we look at this condition. It's no longer about, you know, white gay men. It's basically about our neighbors. John? I, I think Kelsey and Jesse have spoken uh, really beautifully about the evolving needs of people living with HIV and um, really central to that is uh, housing. And so we've got to, uh, in the HIV sector, continue to focus on, on housing, of course, for people living with uh, and also vulnerable to HIV, but more broadly to promote affordability for everyone. So I think that's something that we, we really need to think about looking at the, the critical social supports that help folks um, to thrive. And Jesse, if you were going to advise um, our uh, folks in civil society, whether it's, it's government or nonprofits, um, how should we be thinking about how we can ameliorate uh, AIDS in the United States? Well, the HIV AIDS crisis is not over because not everyone who needs access to medications is getting them. Not everyone knows about PrEP to stop new transmissions of HIV. So, 
frankly, the biggest word for us today is to start talking about what is needed and finding both the personal will and the political will to make it possible for everyone in this country who needs HIV treatments and everyone who's vulnerable to HIV to never have it. So there was one more one more question, which I think uh, we're going to give uh, we're going to throw over to you, uh, Kelsey, because I think it's a very good good question. Um, the question was, um, how does housing relate to AIDS? And we could we 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 can bring that on to things like insurance issues or race or, but but let's talk about housing since that was what the question is. How why is housing important? as a way to address the needs of people living with AIDS. Kelsey? Sure, so unstable housing is um, uh, critical in terms of the HIV epidemic because if you can think about it, if someone who is, let's say HIV positive and um, doesn't have a place to stay, that in practical terms, they don't have a place to store their medications. They don't have a place, they, 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 have to con they have to concern themselves with a roof over their heads before anything else. And that usually takes precedent. Similarly, for people at risk for HIV, if they're concerned about where they're going to stay and their safety, um, healthcare becomes a secondary or tertiary thought. And so that's why um, uh, housing, stable housing is so important. Um, and, uh, and of course, the intersections of that we mentioned, you know, who does um, unstable housing impact the most? The same people that are impacted by HIV and AIDS the most. My sense on these on these issues is that there is no easy solution, right? When you look at the different political camps, um, there are people who feel like um, everything needs to be resolved by a um, investment in some additional service. And there are those who feel like that impinges on each of our uh, individual liberties. I don't know that there's a real uh, solution, but I think dialogues like this, where we talk about intersectionality, where we talk about the conditions that our neighbors uh, might have, where we talk about um, the issues of, of race and age and, and health and transmissibility, um, I think that we can develop uh, solutions for each of our communities and also on a nas national basis. They won't be perfect, but let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Let's, let's just try to make it better. And I think you're all really helping. Uh, John, thank you so much for uh, sharing the work of uh, the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, Jesse Milan, uh, President CEO of AIDS United in Washington, D.C., and Kelsey Louie, um, the Gay Men's Health Crisis. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Attendees, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for your contributions. Everybody stay safe and we'll see you on next Thursday. <laughs>